Right, good morning. And thank you very much for coming. Um, so uh, I think many of you know uh, my colleague Raphael, myself, we founded the Cambridge Centre a few years ago. I think this is like our third or fourth conference. Um, uh, and uh, so we're delighted so many people coming. I think last year we all had to be a metre apart. And it was quite um, uh, Raphael's put a huge amount of work into organising this. I'm going to pass everything to him. Um, obviously we're around. Uh, if you need things, if there's issues with accommodation or food or any of those things, um, please let us know. Um, otherwise, I think um, I'm looking forward to the next couple of days. Thank you. Good morning to everyone, for me as well. I would like to welcome you all very warmly on behalf of the Cambridge Centre for Animal Rights Law to this European Animal Rights Law Conference. Um, as Sean's mentioned, this is the third of our annual conferences and we started the first one in this very room actually, so some of you are here for that, it's great to have you back in the new places as well, um, that's great. Now before I tell you what awaits you in the next two days, and before I share a few reflections on the state of animal rights law more generally, I'd like to say thanks to a number of people and organisations without whom we would not be sitting here today. Uh, we are first of all grateful to our lead sponsor, the Brooks Institute for Animal Rights Law and Policy. The Brooks Institute have been our most generous supporter from before day one, when the centre was really just an idea. And it is thanks to them that we've been able to organise this conference and to pay for all our speakers, accommodation and travel. The Brooks has played a leading role in the development of animal rights law, not only in Cambridge, but also across the pond. And we are honoured to count them as our lead supporter. Tim, Amanda, Sarah, thank you very much for your support and thanks for being here this weekend. We are furthermore grateful to Jeremy Kohler and the Kohler Foundation, who have kindly supported many activities of our centre, including the conference. Unfortunately, Jeremy Kohler could not be here today. Of course, an event like this not only needs financial support, but also people willing to put in the hard work to make it happen. We are grateful to Sabrina, our public relations manager, who's also managing the camera this weekend, and Eva, our teaching net uh, network manager, um, whom you met at the registration desk, sitting right over there. If you need anything, talk to Sean, me, or Sabrina, or Eva. Now we're also grateful, of course, to our speakers for traveling all the way to Cambridge and for sharing their latest research with us. And then. Last but not least, thanks to all of you, the delegates, for being here and for being willing to learn more about this fascinating subject of animal rights law. Now, we're especially grateful for your presence given that we are in a historic week that has been extraordinarily eventful. Due to Queen Elizabeth II's sad passing last week, we're currently in a period of mourning in this country, as you may know, uh, with Her Majesty's funeral scheduled. Um, for Monday. To pay tribute to her, but also to lighten the mood a bit, I have chosen to structure my introductory remarks around the theme famously very close to the Queen's heart. Corgis. <laughs> <laughs> the Queen is said to have had um, over 30 corgis, and her first corgi was Suzanne, um, whom she got at the age of 18. And all the 30 corgis apparently all descended from Suzanne. The Queen's passion for corgis apparently even led her to write letters in the name of her corgis, um, which she addressed to the Jack Russell Terriers of one of her senior <laughs> members of staff. Now, in the next 10 minutes or so, I will attempt to convince you that, perhaps surprisingly, corgis lent themselves very well to describing the current state of animal rights law. I suggest that there are three features in particular which provide analogies between corgis and animal rights law. First, corgis have a very short stature. I take this to be an analogy for the fact that animal, right, animal rights law is still quite a young discipline. Second, corgis are known for their intelligence, their will and their tendency to bark. To me, this is married in animal rights lawyers insightful scholarship, their strength of will um, to pursue an often marginalized subject and their willingness to criticize the status quo. And third, corgis are herding dogs. I will propose that in this respect, they're much like the Cambridge Center for Animal Rights Law, whose aim it is to help create a community of animal rights law scholars and teachers. 
Now, of course, corgis have many other um, distinguishing features, but some of those um, would have been harder to use as analogies. For instance, they have a tendency to drool and to snore. So making a connection with animal rights scholars would have led me into treacherous territory here, I think. Okay, first, as you I'm sure all know, and as you can see on the slide, corgis have a short stature. Animal rights law similarly has a short stature in the sense that compared to other areas of law, it is relatively young and hasn't been around for very long. One of the first, if not the first, animal rights law course to be offered as part of a regular university curriculum was an animal rights law clinic taught by professors Gary Francione and Anna Charlton at Rutgers University in 1919. That's only 32 years ago. By comparison, civil law was first offered at the University of Salamanca in 1254. That's a pretty impressive 768 years ago. Now, the relative novelty of animal rights law is not necessarily a bad thing, I think, but rather it gives it an unparalleled vitality. New groundbreaking rulings are issued on an almost monthly basis. For example, in July, a criminal court in the city of Buenos Aires declared a cougar named Lola Lemon as a subject of rights. <coughs> and in January, the Constitutional Court of Ecuador decided that the rights of nature guaranteed <coughs> under the Constitution also <coughs> extend rights protection to individual animals. This is the famous Estralita case that I'm sure many of you will be familiar with. Now, in addition to the rapid changes we're seeing in animal rights law, its short stature is reflected in the fact that it is a discipline that's particularly popular among students, PhD candidates, and early career scholars. This year, we try to do justice to this generational aspect of the discipline by organizing a special workshop for PhD students, allowing the new generation of animal rights thinkers to present and discuss their ideas and to connect with like-minded people. That workshop took place yesterday and the PhD students are all here for the conference. Some will offer comments to some of the speakers' presentations. I hope you'll get the chance to meet them all during the conference. In a time of many firsts, the century is also proud to say that in 2022, or from 2021 to 2022, um, this was the first year when animal rights law was offered officially as a half paper on the Cambridge undergraduate mm -hmm. law degree. Sean and I were able to build on our experience of having lectured the course on a non-credit basis for four years. And we were pleased to see the enthusiasm of our colleagues at the law faculty, some of whom teach on the course with us. And just because animal rights law has a small stature doesn't necessarily mean that animal rights lawyers cannot aim high. As they say about corgis, they are big dogs in small bodies. And that brings me to my second comparison. Corgis are known for their forceful will and tendency to bark and their cleverness. This has clear parallels to animal rights lawyers. Their steadfastness, their willingness to criticize injustices in the law, and their intelligent scholarship. In this conference, you will see some of that scholarship on display from some of the leading thinkers and scholars in the field. We are delighted to have two fantastic keynote speakers. Today, Richard Ryder, who is the president of the RSBCA, will talk to us about painism, speciesism, and the law. Tomorrow, Justin Marceau from the University of Denver will be joining us to present on glass walls and animal protection messaging. In only a few minutes, we will start off the conference with a panel exploring the foundations of animal rights. With two excellent speakers, we will discuss the moral, political, and legal dimensions of animal rights. This afternoon, the second panel will zero in on the changing legal status of animals. Three speakers will help us understand and reflect on animals' property status, their welfare protections, and the extent to which considerations about their sentience and personhood challenge that status quo. Tomorrow, we will start the day with a panel dedicated to farmed animals, a category of animals that, due to their quantity and the um, extent of their plight, should be of great interest to us all. Three excellent speakers will help us explore questions such as, does a just food system have a place for farmed animals? Why and how should we care about their welfare? 
And how does the law govern these animals? Finally, two speakers will take on the constitutional turn in animal rights law tomorrow afternoon. Here we will critically reflect on how constitutions um, are and should be changing so as to accommodate the interests of non-human animals. Let me now turn to my final analogy, although this is not so much one about animal rights law as a whole, but rather the role of our <coughs> center. Corgis are herding dogs. And this has nice parallels to our center, whose mission it is to bring people together and to help them keep moving, to connect them, to promote a community of animal rights lawyers and scholars. Of course, unlike corgis, we don't do so by nipping at your heels. <laughs> Instead, we have to develop other, better ways of helping to create a community. One of the key ways, of course, is our annual conference, but it's not the only one. Here at Cambridge, we've been running a visitor program, allowing scholars and practitioners from other universities to come and spend time in Cambridge to pursue their research. It's been really rewarding to see a growing network of alumni, many of whom are here today, and to see how they've published the fruit of their labor and progress their careers. Starting last year, we've also been running an annual essay competition for university and high school students. This competition has served as a nice way of getting students from around the world to think about animal rights questions, and it was great to see that many of them have chosen to pursue those questions further in their studies. In fact, one of the winners of our high school competition this year will be hosting a talk by our center at their school. And she's organized a social media competition whose proceeds she's um, kindly donated to the center. Another powerful way of promoting a community are the law lectures workshops, which the center is organizing. <coughs> These workshops are for lecturers interested in offering animal rights law, but who may not have the time to develop their own syllabus. Our first course for a dozen of people was held during um, summer in Antwerp and we're planning two more courses next year and every year after that. We share all our materials from the Cambridge course with the lectures and help them produce their own courses. To help support this goal, we're delighted to say that we've just launched an animal rights law teaching network. This network will bring animal rights law lectures closer together and help them share ideas, syllabi, slide decks, or offer guest lectures and promote animal rights law teaching in other ways. Eva had the excellent idea of creating this network and she'll be happy to talk to you, I'm sure, if you are interested in joining. Eva, do you want to raise your hand, maybe? Yes, very good. <laughs> now, the Law Lectures workshops are not just to encourage a network, however, our aim in the next five years is to have animal rights law being taught in a hundred universities across um, Europe and beyond. And we are on track, I think, to achieve that. Finally, we're pleased to say that our animal rights law textbook will be published in March 2023, in time to be added to the reading list for the next academic year. Sean and I had the idea of writing this textbook when we developed our Cambridge course and we realized that there's really no textbook that covers all the different facets of animal rights law. We hope that the book will not only able, uh, be able to boost the animal rights law teaching community, but also help push animal rights law more into the mainstream. Okay, to conclude that, let me say a few words about organization. The presentations you'll be um, seeing will all last 20 minutes and will be followed by a panel discussion at the end. You are all welcome and encouraged to join in in the discussion with questions or comments. We will turn off the recordings during the discussions. Coffee and lunch will be served in this room, just at the back. And you're free to take your snacks and drinks outside to the garden if you'd like, or the entrance area. The conference dinner tonight will be served in the college dining hall for all the speakers and those who booked a ticket. All food and drinks, of course, are cloud-based. The lavatories are downstairs if you need them. You'll just um, find your, the door to the right there in the back and then take another right downstairs. And here, we would not encourage drawing inspiration from corgis, but probably prefer a tree outside, I think. <laughs> okay, speaking one last time of corgis, I promise. 
Does anyone know what will happen to the queen's two corgis whom she left behind? Yes? That's right. So Prince Andrew will be looking after them. Let's hope that that's a fate that animal rights law will not share. <laughs> Thank you all. So we'll now start.